Someone whispered to me once that Franchi was the leader of one of the most powerful clandestine groups in North Italy, a man of legendary courage. Franchi became my hero. Franchi, whose real name was Edgaro Sogna, uh, was a monarchist, such a fervent anti-communist that after the war he joined an extreme right-wing group and was accused of having collaborated in a reactionary coup. But what does it matter? Sogno is still the dream of my childhood. The liberation was a common undertaking achieved by people of different colors. Today in Italy, some people say that the War of Liberation was a tragic period of division, and that now we need national reconciliation. The memory of those terrible years ought to be repressed, but repression causes neurosis, while reconciliation means compassion and respect for all those who fought the war in good faith. Forgiving does not mean forgetting. I can even admit that Eichmann believed sincerely in his mission, but I do not feel like saying, okay, go back and do it again. We are here to remember what happened and to declare solemnly that they must never do it again. But who are they? If we think again of the totalitarian governments that dominated Europe before the Second World War, we can easily say that they are unlikely to return in the same form in different historic circumstances. Mussolini's fascism was based on the idea of a charismatic leader on corporativism, on the utopia of the fateful destiny of Rome, on the imperialistic will to conquer new lands, on inflammatory nationalism, on the ideal of an entirely regimented nation of black shirts, on the rejection of parliamentary democracy, and on anti-Semitism. I admit that Alianza Nazionale, which sprang from the Movimento Sociale Italiano, is certainly a right-wing party, but it has little to do with the old fascism. Similarly, even though I am worried by the various pro-Nazi movements active here and there in Europe, Russia included, I don't think that Nazism is in its original form, is about to reappear as a movement involving an entire nation. Nonetheless, even though political regimes can be overturned and ideologies criticized and delegitimized behind a regime and its ideology, there is always a way of thinking and feeling, a series of cultural habits, a nebula of obscure instincts and unfathomable drives. Is there then another ghost wandering through Europe, not to mention other parts of the world? Ionesco once said, count and all the rest is idle chatter. Linguistic habits are often important symptoms of unspoken sentiments. Allow me therefore to ask why not only the resistance but the entire Second World War has been defined all over the world as a struggle against fascism. If you reread Hemingway's For Whom the Bell Tolls, you will discover that Robert Jordan identifies his enemies with the fascists even when he is thinking of the Spanish phalangists. I yield the floor to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, quote, The victory of the American people and their allies will be a victory against fascism and the blind alley of despotism that it represents. On September 23, 1944, during the McCarthy period, Americans who had taken part in the Spanish Civil War were called premature anti-fascists, another way of saying that fighting Hitler in the 40s was a moral duty for all good Americans, but fighting against Franco too soon in the 30s was suspect. Why was an expression like fascist pig used by American radicals even to indicate a policeman who did not approve of what they smoked? Why didn't they say, guacalard pig, phalangist pig? Stasha big, whistling big, anti Pavlik big, or Nazi big. Mein Kampf is the complete manifesto of a political program. Nazism had a theory of race and Aryanism, a precise notion of Entarte Kunst, degenerate art, a philosophy of the will to power and of the Ubermensch. Nazism was decidedly anti-Christian and neo-pagan. Just as Stalin's diamat, the official version of Marxism, was clearly materialistic and atheist. If by totalitarian we mean a regime that subordinates all individual acts to the 
state in its ideology that Nazism and Stalinism were totalitarian regimes. Fascism was certainly a dictatorship, but it was not only totalitarian, not so much for its moderation as for the philosophical weakness of its ideology. Contrary to commonly held belief, Italian fascism did not have a philosophy of its own. The article on fascism signed by Mussolini for the Encyclopedia Tricani was written or fundamentally inspired by Giovanni Gentile, but it reflected a late Hegelian notion of the ethical and absolute state that Mussolini never completely realized. Mussolini had no philosophy. All he had was rhetoric. He started out as a militant atheist, only to sign the concordat with the church and to consort with the bishops who blessed the fascist banners. In his early anti-clerical years, according to a plausible story, he once asked God to strike him dead on the spot to prove his existence. God evidently had other fish to fry at the time. In subsequent years, Mussolini always mentioned God in his speeches and was not above having himself called the man of providence. It can be said that Italian fascism was the first right-wing dictatorship to dominate a European country, and that all similar movie movements later found a sort of common archetype in Mussolini's regime. Italian fascism was the first to create a military liturgy, a folklore, and even a style of dress, which enjoyed great success abroad than Armani, Benetton, or Versace today. It was not until the 30s that the fascist movement sprang up in England, with Mosley and in Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, Poland, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Greece, Yugoslavia, Spain, Portugal, Norway, and even South America, not to mention Germany. It was Italian fascism that convinced many European liberal leaders that the new regime was implementing interesting social reforms, capable of providing a moderately revolutionary alternative to the communist threat. However, this historical precedence does not strike me as sufficient as to explain why the word fascism has become a synecdoche, a denomination pars pro toto for different totalitarian movements. It is pointless to say that fascism contained in itself all the elements of successive totalitarian movements, so to speak, in a quintessential state. On the contrary, fascism contained no quintessence, and not even a single it was a fuzzy form of totalitarianism. It was not a monolithic ideology, but rather a collage of diverse political and philosophical ideas, a tangle of contradictions. It is possible to conceive of a totalitarian movement that manages to reconcile monarchy and revolution, the royal army and Mussolini's private militia, the privileges granted the church, and a state education system that extolled violence, total control and a free market. The fascist party came into being proclaiming a new revolutionary order, but it was financed by the most conservative landowners, who were expecting a counter-revolution. The Republican fascism of the early days endured for 20 years, proclaiming its loyalty to the royal family, allowing a dues to soldiers on arm-in-arm -arm with the king, to whom he also offered the title of emperor. But when in 1943 the king sacked Mussolini, the party resurfaced two months later with the help of the Germans under the flag of a social republic, thus recycling its old revolutionary score, enhanced by a quasi-Jacobin streak. There was only one Nazi architecture and one Nazi art. If the architect of the Nazi was Albert Speer, there was no room for Mies van der Rohe. In the same way, under Stalin, if Lamarck was right, there was no room for Darwin. In contrast, there certainly were fascist architects, but alongside their pseudo-coliseums, there is also rows of new buildings inspired by the modern rationalism of Ropias. The fascists had no Shadanov. In Italy, there were two important art prizes. The Vermeo Cremona was controlled by an uncultivated and fanatical fascist like Farinacci encourage propagandistic art. I can remember the picture with titles like Listening to the Deuce's Speech on the Radio and Mental States Created by Fascism. And the Premio Bergamo, sponsored by a cultivated and re 
reasonably tolerant fascist like Bataille, who protected art for art's sake, and the new avant-garde art that had been banned in Germany as corrupted and crypto-communist, contrary to Napoleonian kitsch, the only art allowed. The Italian national poet was Denunzio, a fop who in Germany or Russia would have found himself in front of a firing squad. He was elevated to the rank of bard to the regime for his nationalism and cult of heroism, with the addition of a strong dash of French decadence. Let's take futurism. It ought to have been considered an example of Antart Kunst, like expressionism, cubism, and surrealism. But for the first, Italian futurists were nationalists. For aesthetic reasons, they backed Italy's entry into the First World War. They celebrated speed, violence, and risk, and in certain way the aspects seem close to the fascist cult of youth. When fascism identified itself with ancient Rome and rediscovered rural tradition, Marinetti, who said an automobile was more beautiful than the victory of Samothrace, and even wanted to do away with moonlight, was named after a member of the Academy d'Italia, a body that treated moonlight with great respect. Many of the future partisans and intellectuals of the Communist Party were educated by the GUF, the Fascist Association of University Students, which was intended to be the cradle of a new fascist culture. These clubs became a sort of intellectual melting pot in which new ideas circulated without any real ideological control, not so much because party officials were tolerant, but because few of them possessed the intellectual equipment required to keep a check on the clubs. In the course of those two decades, the poetry of the so-called Hermetic School represented a reaction to the pompous style of the regime. These poets were allowed to elaborate their literary protest from inside the ivory tower. The sentiments of the Hermetic poets were exactly the opposite of the fascist cult of optimism and heroism. The regime tolerated this overt, albeit socially imperceptible, dissent because they did not pay sufficient attention to such obscure jargon, which does not mean that Italian fascism was tolerant. Gramsci remained in prison until his death. Mariotti and the Rosali brothers were murdered. The free press suppressed and the labor unions dismantled and political dissidents confined to remote islands. Legislative power became a mere shame executive branch of government, which controlled the judiciary and the mass media, too, enacted new laws directly. This body of new law included the race laws, Italy's formal endorsement of the Holocaust. The inconsistent image I have described here was not due to tolerance. It was an example of political and ideological chaos, but it was orderly chaos, organized confusion. Fascism was philosophically unsound, but on an emotional level it was firmly anchored in certain archetypes. We have now come to the second part of my case. There was only one Nazism, and we cannot describe the ultra-Catholic phalangism of Franco as Nazism, given that Nazism is fundamentally pagan, polytheistic, and anti-Christian. Otherwise, it is not Nazism. On the other hand, you can play the fascism game many ways, and the name of the game does not change. According to Wittgenstein, what happens with the notion of fascism is what happens with the notion of play. A game can be competitive or otherwise. It can involve one or more people. It may require some particular skills or none. There may be money at stake or not. Games are a series of diverse activities that reveal only a few family resemblances. Let us suppose that there is a series of political groups. Group 1 is characterized by the aspects A, B, C, group 2 by B, C, D, and so on. 2 is similar to 1 insofar as they have two aspects in common. 3 is similar to 2, and 4 is similar to 3 for the same reason. Note that 3 is also similar to 1. They share the aspect C. The most curious case is that of 4, obviously similar to 3 and 2, but without any characteristics in common with 1. Nevertheless, because of the uninterrupted series of decreasing similarities between 1 and 4, there remains, by virtue of a sort of illusory transitiveness, 
a sense of kinship between four and one. The term fascism fits everything because it is possible to eliminate one or more aspects from a fascist regime, and it will always be recognizably fascist. Remove the imperialist dimensions from fascism, and you get Franco or Salazar. Remove the colonialist dimension, and you get Balkan fascism. Add to Italian fascism a dash of radical anti-capitalism, which never appealed to Mussolini, and you get Ezra Pound. Add the cult of Celtic mythology and the mysticism of the Grail, completely extraneous to official fascism, and you get one of the most respected gurus of fascism, Julius Evola. Despite this confusion, I think it is possible to draw up a list of characteristics typical of what I should like to call ur-fascism or eternal fascism. These characteristics cannot be regimented into a system. Many are mutually exclusive and are typical of other forms of despotism or fanaticism, but all you need is one of them to be present and a fascist nebula will begin to coagulate. One, the first characteristic of ur-fascism is the cult of tradition. Traditionalism is older than fascism. It was not only typical of Catholic counter-revolutionary thinking after the French Revolution, but was born in the late Hellenic period as a reaction to classical Greek rationalism. In the Mediterranean basin, the peoples of different religions, all indulgently welcome into the Roman pantheon, began dreaming of a revelation received at the dawn of human history. This revelation lay for a long time concealed under a veil of languages by now forgotten. It was guarded by Egyptian hieroglyphics, Celtic runes, and the sacred writings still unknown of the Asiatic religions. This new culture was to be syncretic. Syncreticism is not merely, as the dictionaries say, the combination of different forms of beliefs or practices. A combination like this must tolerate contradictions. messages contain a grain of wisdom, and when they seem to be saying different or incompatible things, it is only because they all allude allegorically to some original truth. Consequently, there can be no advancement of learning. The truth has already been announced once and for all, and all we can do is continue interpreting its obscure message. It suffices to take a look at the syllabus of every fascist movement, and you will find the principal traditionalist thinkers. Nazi gnosis fed on the traditionalist, syncretic, and occult elements. The most important theorist of the new Italian right, Julius Evola, mixed the grail with the protocols of the elders of Zion, and alchemy with the Holy Roman Empire. The very fact that, in order to demonstrate its open-minded stance, a part of the Italian right has recently widened its syllabus by putting together De Moster, Quinon, and Gramsci in glaring evidence of syncreticism. If you browse through the New Age sections of American bookshops, you will even find St. Augustine, who, as far as I know, was not a fascist. But putting together St. Augustine and Stonehenge, now that is a symptom of ur-fascism. Traditionalism implies the rejection of modernism. Both the fascists and the Nazis worshipped technology, while traditionalist thinkers usually reject technology as the negation of traditional spiritual values. Nevertheless, although Nazism was proud of its industrial successes, its praise of modern modernity was only the superficial aspect of an ideology based on blood and soil, blood und Boden. The rejection of disguised as a condemnation of the capitalist way of life, but mainly concerned rejection of the spirit of 1789. The Enlightenment and the Age of Reason were seen as the beginning of modern depravity. In this sense, ur-fascism can be defined as irrationalism. 3. Irrationalism also depends on the cult of action for action's sake. Action is beautiful in itself, and therefore must be implemented before any form of reflection. Thinking is a form of emasculation. Therefore, culture is suspect insofar as it, uh, it is identified with critical attitudes. From the statement attributed to Goebbels, when I hear the talk of culture, I take out my business.
pistol, to the frequent use of expressions like goddamn intellectuals, eggheads, radical snobs, the universities are a den of communists, suspicion of intellectual life has always been a symptom of her fascism. The official fascist intellectuals were mainly committed to accusing modern culture and the liberal intelligentsia of having abandoned traditional values. Four, no form of sense criticism can accept criticism. The critical spirit makes distinctions and distinguishes. Distinguishing is a sign of modernity. In modern culture, the scientific community sees dissent as a tool with which to promote the advancement of learning. For her fascism, dissent is betrayal. Five, dissent is moreover a sign of diversity. Her fascism grows and seeks a consensus by exploiting and exacerbating the natural fear of difference. The first appeal of a fascist or prematurely fascist movement is a call against intruders. Her fascism is therefore racist by definition. Six. Her fascism springs from an individual or social frustration, which explains why one of the characteristics typical of historic fascist movements was the appeal to the frustrated middle classes. Disquieted by some economic crisis or political humiliation, and frightened by social pressure from below. In our day, in which the old proletarians are becoming petite bourgeois, and the lumpen proletariat has ex excluded itself from the political arena, fascism will find its audience in this new majority. 7. To those with no social identity at all, her fascism says that their only privilege is the most common privilege of all, that of being born in the same country. This is the origin of nationalism. Moreover, the only ones who can provide the nation with an identity are the enemy. Thus, at the root of her fascist psychology lies the obsession with conspiracies, preferably international ones. The disciples must feel that they are under siege. The easiest way to construct a conspiracy is to appeal to xenophobia. But conspiracies must also come from the inside. The Jews are usually the best target because they offer the advantage of being at once both inside and outside. In America, the latest example of this obsession with conspiracies is Pat Robertson's book, The New World Order. 8. The disciples must feel humiliated by the enemy's vaunted wealth and power. When I was a little boy, they taught me that the English were the five meals people, eating more often than the poor but sober Italians. The Jews are wealthy and help one another through a secret network of mutual assistance, but the disciples must nonetheless feel they can defeat the enemy. Thus, thanks to continual shifting in the rhetorical register, the enemy is at once too strong and too weak. Fascist regimes are doomed to lose their wars because they are constitutionally incapable of making an objective assessment of the enemy's strength. 9. For er fascism there is no struggle for life, but rather a life for struggle. Pacifism is therefore collusion with the enemy. Pacifism is bad, because life is a permanent war. This, however, brings with it an Armageddon complex. Since the enemy can and must be defeated, there must be a last battle after which the movement will rule the world. Such a final solution implies a subsequent era of peace, a golden age that contradicts the principle of permanent war. No fascist leader has ever managed to resolve this contradiction. 10. Elitism is a typical aspect of all reactionary ideologies, insofar as it is basically aristocratic. In the course of history, all forms of aristocratic and militaristic elitism have implied scorn for the weak. Er, fascism cannot do without breaching a popular elitism. Every individual belongs to the best people in the world. Party members are the best citizens, and every citizen can become a party member. But you cannot have patricians without plebeians. The leader who is well aware that his power has not been obtained by delegation, but by 
was taken by force also knows that his power is based on the weakness of the masses, who are so weak as to need and deserve a dominator, since the group is organized hierarchically along military lines. Each subordinate leader looks down on his inferior, and each of his inferiors looks down in turn on his own underlings. All this looking down reinforces the sense of a mass elite. Eleven. From this point of view, everyone is trained to become a hero. In every mythology, the hero is an exceptional being, but in the ur-fascist ideology, heroism is the norm. This cult of heroism is closely connected to the cult of death. There is nothing accidental about the fact that the motto of the phalanges was Viva la Muerta. Normal people are told that death is unpleasant but has to be faced with dignity. Believers are told that it is a painful way to attain a supernatural happiness. But the ur fascist hero aspires to death, hailed as the finest reward for a heroic life. The ur fascist hero is impatient to die. In his impatience, it should be noted, he usually manages to make others die in his place. 12. Since both permanent war and heroism are difficult games to play, the ur fascist transfers his will to power onto sexual questions. This is the origin of machismo, which implies contempt for women and an intolerant condemnation for nonconformist sexual habits, from chastity to homosexuality. Since sex is also a difficult game to play, the ur fascist hero plays with weapons, which are his Ersatz penis. His war games are due to permanent state of penis envy. 13. Ur fascism is based on qualitative populism. In a democracy, the citizens enjoy individual rights, but as a whole, the citizens have a political impact only from a quantitative point of view. The decisions of the majority are followed. For Ur fascists, individuals have no rights, and the people is conceived of a monolithic entity that expresses the common will. Since no quantity of human beings can possess a common will, the leader claims to be their interpreter. Having lost their power to delegate, the citizens do not act. They are only called upon pars pro toto to play their role as the people. The people is thus merely a theatrical pretense. For a good example of qualitative populism, we no longer need Piazza Vienzia or the stadium in Nuremberg. In our future, there looms qualitative TV or internet populism, in which the emotional response of a selected group of citizens can be presented and accepted as the voice of the people. As a result of its qualitative populism, Ur fascism has to oppose rotten parliamentary governments. One of the first things Mussolini said in the Italian parliaments was, I could have transformed this gray and sordid chamber into a biofog for my soldiers. As a matter of fact, he immediately found a better billet for his sol soldiery, but shortly after that he dissolved the parliament. Every time a politician cast doubt on the legitimacy of the parliament, because it no longer represents the voice of the people, there is a suspicion of ur-fascism. 14. Ur-fascism uses Newspeak. Newspeak was invented by Orwell in 1984 as the official language of Ingsoc, the English socialist movement, the ele but elements of Ur-fascism are common to different forms of dictatorship. All the Nazi and fascist scholastic texts were based on poor vocabulary and elementary syntax, the aim being to limit the instruments available to complex and critical reasoning. But we must be prepared to identify other types of newspeak, even when they take the innocent form of a popular talk show. Now that I have listed the possible characteristics of her fascism, let me come to a conclusion. On the morning of 27th July 1943, I learned from a radio news broadcast that fascism had collapsed and Mussolini had been arrested. My mother sent me to buy a newspaper. I went to the nearest newsstand and saw that there were newspapers, but the names were different. Moreover, after 
after a quick glance at the headlines, I realized that every newspaper said something different. I bought one at random and read the message printed on the front page, signed by five or six political parties like Democrazia Cristiana, Partito Communista, Partito Socialista, Partito Diazone, and Partito Liberale. Until that moment, I had believed that there was only one party in every country, and that in Italy there was only the National Fascist Party. I was discovering that in my country there could be many different parties at the same time. What's more, since I was a smart kid, I realized right away that all those parties could not have emerged overnight. Thus I understood that they had already existed as clandestine organizations. The message celebrated the end of the dictatorship and the return of freedom, freedom of speech, of the press, of political association. My God, I had never read words like freedom or dictatorship in all my life. By virtue of these words, I was reborn as a free Western man. We must make sure that the sense of these words is not forgotten again. Er, fascism is still around us, sometimes in civilian clothes. It would be so easy for us if someone would look out onto the world stage and say, I want to reopen Auschwitz. I want the black shirts to march through the streets of Italy once more. Alas, life is not so simple. Or fascism can still return in the most innocent of guises. Our duty is to unmask it and to point the finger at each of its new forms every day in every part of the world. Once more, I yield the floor to Roosevelt. Quote, I dare to say that if American democracy ceased to progress as a living force, seeking night and day by peaceful means to improve the condition of our citizens, the power of fascism would grow in our country. Freedom and liberation are never-ending tasks. Let this be our motto. Do not forget. And now I should like to close with a poem by Franco Fortini. On the parapet of the bridge, the heads of hanged men, in the water of the fountain, the drool of hanged men, on the cobbles of the market, the fingernails of men shot down, on the dry grass of the meadow, the teeth of men shot down. from Umberto Eco's How to Spot a Fascist. Thanks so much for joining us. I hope you enjoyed. Just like and subscribe if it's something you'd like to see more of. Have a great day.